But the important thing tonight is to hear from our good friend, Dr. Friedman. And it was um, about two years ago, I had the pleasure of presenting Dr. Friedman to a large group of distinguished Belgium economists, bankers, and businessmen at a luncheon in the American Embassy at Brussels. Tonight, I have the honor of presenting to him to this distinguished audience. Our speaker this evening is the Paul Snowden Russell Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, a member of the research staff of the National Bureau of Economic Research. He is a columnist and contributing editor for Newsweek magazine. This year, he is serving as a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco. For many years, he has been known for his incisive research and writing regarding monetary theory and policy. There is hardly a college economics class in the United States today that does not include a careful study of his theories. He has been a valued counselor to several United States presidents. As evidence of the growing international respect which he commands, he received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1976. On behalf of the Board of Regents of Pepperdine University, I am pleased to present the founding speaker of the Pepperdine Associates, Dr. Milton Friedman. Uh, Ambassador Firestone, I was uh, very great. Uh, very, I recall with great pleasure, indeed, the occasion on which Ambassador Firestone was my host in Belgium. We were over there in connection with a meeting of the Montpelier Society. It's a society which was founded, as many of you may know, some 30 years ago by Friedrich von Hayek in in Switzerland. I well remember when I came back from the first meeting of that. And I was sitting around the table at the Quadrangle Club at the University of Chicago. One of my colleagues was Hans, Morgen, Hans Morgenthau, a professor of political science. And he asked me where we had been. And I told him where we had been and what kind of a society we had founded. And he said, oh, I see, the veterans of the wars of the 19th century. <laughs> I appreciate, I was very much interested in, in Bill Banowski's descriptions of your associates but I couldn't help feeling that I had been faithless to my profession, that I made a great mistake in not asking for a percentage of the house take. <laughs> and I may say also I was very much disappointed in Bill Banowski's announcement that the fee was $1,000 a year with no indexing for inflation. In turning to a more serious discussion, I ought to start by perhaps saying a word about the uh, 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 welcoming committee that many of you may have passed through on entering the hotel. I refer to the pickets who were picketing against me, supposedly, on the grounds of the fact that a year and a half ago, or well, almost two years ago now, I spent six days in Chile under the auspices of a private foundation giving a series of lectures on inflation and how to cure it of exactly the same kind that I have given in many other countries. I have since then not known whether to be more amused or more annoyed by the attention that has received. Amused at the extraordinary power which has been attributed to me of controlling seemingly by extrasensory perception from my office in Chicago every detail of economic policy in Chile. <laughs> or more annoyed by what I regard as evidence of a very serious threat to freedom of speech, to freedom of intellectual discourse that is offered by the kind of demonstration that you had here. I may say that when I was in Sweden in December, there was also a demonstration of the same kind, and on the last day before I left Sweden, 
when I was giving a formal lecture, which is part of the obligations of Nobel laureates, I pre preceded it by making a comment on the demonstrations, in which I said, and I believe this very sincerely, that the stench of Nazism was in the air. That the idea of people trying to prevent other people from speaking or other people from hearing them by making it inconvenient to pass through picket lines, by shouts and yelling, which has nothing whatsoever to do with rational discourse, was a major and serious threat to free society. I mention on that occasion the experience of Nazi Germany in the 1930s, when before Hitler came into power, the communists and the Nazis joined together in this effort, because after all, communism and Nazism are but two sides of the same coin. And, and the subsequent effect of this was a chilling effect on the academic community in Germany. And after Hitler came to power, there was essentially no opposition offered by the academic community. It's very easy to dismiss this kind of a demonstration. There is a strong temptation on my part to say, I'm not going to let those hoodlums prevent me from going where I want to go and say what I'm going to say. And yet it would be dishonest on my part not to say that there is an inhibiting effect. The effect is to raise significantly the cost. And if one considers the issue that is raised, regardless of what you think about Chile, if you once take the position that a scholar or an individual of any kind, scholar or not, is not supposed to travel to and lecture in a country of whose politics he disapproves, and consider what the implications of that are, you will see that the implications of that are a completely divided world. How are we going to get our ideas behind the Iron Curtain? How are we going to get the, our ideas to countries we do, not we do not approve of unless we are willing and able to go there and to express those ideas? I have given talks of the kind I gave in Chile. I have given them in Yugoslavia, which is a communist country. I have given them in South Africa, which in a different respect is not a very free society. I have given them in Australia and Japan and other countries of the world. But there is no doubt that one of the effects of this kind of demonstration, and I don't think we ought to underrate their importance, is to inhibit colleagues of mine and other people, myself, from doing likewise. Is there any doubt that any intellectual who is invited to go and lecture in Chile will think three times now before he goes? And that is, I think, a very great cost, and we have to be on our guard against allowing these Nazi hoodlums to have that inhibiting effect on us. I may say, with respect to Chile, just to clear the air, I, in, the fame, in the words that became famous during congressional investigations some 10 or 20 years ago, I am not now and never have been a, cons a, a, a consultant in any way whatsoever to the military junta. <laughs> I went down there under the auspices of a private foundation. I saw a great many people, including uh, General Pinochet and other members of his junta. I said exactly the same thing in private that I always say in public. I do not approve of the military regime, but I believe that when the military regime did take over, Chile had the alternative only between two evil systems of government, between the evil system of government of a communist Marxist takeover under Allende or the evil system of a military dictatorship. Both are bad, but the military dictatorship at least has a virtue that there is more chance of its being ended and a democratic society established. I do not know any case on record in which a collectivist communist government once in office has been eliminated and a, uh, and a reasonably democratic society established. We know at least... A n We know at least a number of cases in which a military regime has moved in the direction of freedom. 
Greece is one case. Portugal is a case which today is in great trouble, but is at least in that same direction. So I must say, as between the two evils, I have no doubt as to which is the lesser. Well, enough about Chile. Let me turn to my subject, although my subject is not unrelated to Chile, because my subject is the future of capitalism. And by that term, when I speak of the future of capitalism, I mean the future of competitive capitalism, of free enterprise capitalism. In a certain sense, every major society is capitalist. Russia has a great deal of capital. But the capital is under the control of the state, under the control of governmental officials who are supposedly acting as the agent of the state. And that turns it into a wholly different system than a system under which capital is under the control of individuals in their private capacity as owners, as operators of industry. And what, we are, what I want to speak about tonight is what is the future of private enterprise, competitive capitalism. The reason this is very close to what I was just saying about Chile is because the future of private enterprise capitalism is also the future of a free society. There is no way, no possibility of having a politically free society unless the major part of its economic resources are operated under a capitalist private enterprise system. The real question, therefore, is the future of freedom, of human freedom. The real question, the question that I want to talk about, is whether we are going to complete the movement that has been going on for the past 40 or 50 years, away from a free society and toward a collectivist society, whether we're going to continue down that path until we have followed Chile in the, in the direction of losing our political freedom explicitly and coming under the thumb of an all-powerful government, or whether we are going to be able to halt that trend, perhaps even reverse it, and establish a greater degree of freedom. One thing is clear. We cannot continue along the lines that we've been moving. In 1928, less than 50 years ago, Government at all levels, federal, state, and local, spent less than 10% of the national income. Two-thirds of that at the federal and state level. I mean, at the state and local level. Federal government spending amounted to less than 3% of the national income. Today, total government spending at all levels amounts to 40% of the national income, and two-thirds of that is on the federal level. So federal government spending has moved in the course of less than 50 years from 3% to over 25%, total spending from 10 to 40. Now, I guarantee you one thing. In the next 50 years, government spending cannot move from 40% of the national income to 160%. <laughs> Legislatures have tried to enact that the value of pi shall be exactly 3 and a seven but they cannot repeal the laws of arithmetic. So we cannot continue on this path. And the question is, will we keep trying to continue on this path until we have lost our freedom and turned our lives over to an all-powerful government in Washington, or will we stop? In judging this possibility, in judging the direction we're going and where we may be going, it's worth talking a little bit about where we are and how we got to where we are, about the present and the past. Let me say at the outset, in talking about the present, with all the problems I'm going to talk about, this still remains a predominantly free society. There is no great country in the world. There are some small enclaves, but there is no great country in the world today that offers as much freedom to the, to the individual as the United States does. But having said that, we ought also to recognize how far we have come away from the how far we have gone away from the ideal of freedom and the extent to which our lives are restricted by governmental enactments. In talking about freedom, it's important at the outset to distinguish two different meanings on the economic level to the concept of free enterprise. There is no term 
which is more misused and more misunderstood. One meaning that is often attached to free enterprise is a meaning that enterprises shall be free to do what they want. That is not the meaning that has historically been attached to free enterprise or should be attached to it. What we really mean by free enterprise is the freedom of individuals to set up enterprises, the freedom of an individual to engage in an activity so long as he uses only voluntary methods of getting other individuals to cooperate with him. And if you want to look at how far we have moved from the basic concept of free enterprise, you can look at the question of how free is anyone to set up an enterprise. You are not free to establish a bank or to go into the taxicab business unless you can get a certificate of convenience and necessity from the local or state or federal authority. You cannot become a lawyer or a physician or a plumber or a mortician, and you can name many other cases, unless you can get a license from the government to engage in that activity. You cannot go into the business of delivering mail or providing electricity. Oh, what's that? No one delivers <laughs> well, we have a U.S. Postal Service that does the usual government, governmentally efficient job of delivering it. You cannot go into the business of delivering mail or of providing electricity or of, uh, uh, or of providing telephone service unless you get a permit and a permission from the government to do so. You cannot raise funds on the capital market and get other people to lend you money unless you go through the SEC and fill out the 400 pages of forms that they require. You cannot even today, any longer, to take the latest restriction on freedom, you cannot engage in voluntary deals with others about the make bets with other people about the future prices of commodities. <laughs> Delighted to have an echo. Yeah, I have the great advantage of having a microphone. You cannot engage, as I say, in future trading unless you get the approval. Uh, I forget the name of the latest batch of, of, uh, of, of uh, initials, but there has recently been set up something like the Commodity Futures Trading Corporation, which is a government organization approving futures trading. If you want to go away from this question of free enterprise in that sense, another way of looking at the extent to which we have moved away from a free society is that 40% of our earnings on the average is co-opted by the government. Each and every one of us works from the 1st of January to something late in April or in May in order to pay governmental expenses before we can start to work for our own expenses. If you want to look at it still another way, the government owns 48% of every corporation in the United States. We talk about ourselves as a free enterprise society. Yet in terms of the fundamental question of who owns the means of production in the corporate sector, we are 48% socialist. Because the corporate tax is 48%, what does it mean if I own 1% of a corporation? It means I'm entitled to 1% of the profits and 1% of the losses. Well, the federal government shares 48% of your profits and 48% of your losses, at least if you have some previous profits to offset those losses against. Once when I was in Yugoslavia some years ago, I calculated that the difference in the degree of socialism in the United States and communist Yugoslavia was exactly 18 percentage points. Because the US government took 48% of the profits of every corporation, and the Yugoslav government took whatever 48 plus 18 is, I guess that's 66% uh, 66, uh, 66 of the profits of every corporation. And of course, those numbers grossly understate the role of the government because of its effect in regulating business in areas other than those which derive from its taxation. Let me give you another example of the extent to which we've lost freedom. About a year or so ago, I had a debate in Washington with that uh, uh, 
great saint of the United States consumer, Ralph Nader. <laughs> and I planted a question on him because I knew what the answer would be and I wanted to extract the answer. And the question I took up was a question of state laws requiring people who ride motorcycles to wear motorcycle helmets, to wear helmets. Now, I believe in many ways that law is the best litmus paper I know to distinguish true believers in individualism from people who do not believe in individualism. Because this is a case in which the man riding the motorcycle is risking only his own life. He may be a damn fool to drive that motorcycle without a helmet, but part of freedom and liberty is a freedom to be a damn fool. Part of, And so I expressed the view that the state laws which make it compulsory for people who are riding motorcycles to wear helmets was against individual freedom and against the principles of a free society and asked Ralph Nader what his opinion was. And Ralph gave the answer I expected he would. He said, well, that's very all very well for a different society. But you must realize today that if a motorcycle dri motorcyclist driving down the road without a helmet splashes himself on the pavement, a government-subsidized ambulance will come to pick him up. It will take him to a government-subsidized hospital. He will be buried in a government-subsidized cemetery, and his wife and children will be supported by government-subsidized welfare. And therefore, he said, we can't let him. <laughs> but what he is, in effect, saying is that every single one of us bears on, the ba on our back a stamp saying, property of the U.S. government do not fold, bend, or mutilate. <laughs> and that is essentially the fundamental principle, the fundamental approach that animates the Ralph Naders of our time, the people who want the power to be in government. You see the example of it all over. You see it in a law which was passed a few years ago, which requires the Treasury Department to report to the Congress a category called tax expenditures. Now, tax expenditures are taxes which are not collected from you because of various deductions permitted by the law, such deductions as interest or uh, uh, excess depreciation or whatnot. And the whole principle is that you are, after all, the property of the U.S. government. You work for the U.S. government. And the U.S. government lets you keep a little of what you earn in order to be sure that they'll keep you working hard for them. But the rest of it is a property of the U.S. government. And if the U.S. government allows you to deduct something from your taxes, well, then it's providing that's an expenditure. It's a tax expenditure. It's not a right that you have to keep it. It's not your income. It's theirs. We have gone very far indeed along the road to losing freedom. But now you may say to me, but you're talking only about economic matters, about whether you can enter a profession or an occupation. What about political freedom? What about the freedom of speech? Well, do not be under any misconception on that respect either. How many businessmen has anybody in this room heard in the past 10 years who have been willing to stand up on public rostrums and take issue with governmental policies? I have heard many a businessman get up and express general sentiments in favor of free enterprise and of a ca a co competition. I have heard very few get up and criticize particular measures taken by government, and I don't blame them. They would be fools to do it, because any businessman who has the nerve to do that has to look over one shoulder and see what the IRS is going to do to his books the next day. And he has to look over the other shoulder and see whether the Justice Department is going to launch an antitrust suit. And then he has to find two or three more shoulders to see what the FTC is going to do. And you take any other three letters of the alphabet, and you have to ask what they're going to do to you, too. So in fact, you cannot a businessman today does not have effective freedom of speech. He cannot do it. Well, businessmen don't matter. They're only material business people. What about those? people of whom we're really concerned, the intellectuals. Well, I ask my fellow colleagues, suppose I take a professor from a medical school whose, uh, f whose research and training is largely being financed by the National Institutes of Health. Do you suppose he wouldn't think three times before he gives a speech against socialized medicine? 
Suppose I take one of my colleagues in economics who has been supported by a grant from the National Science Foundation. I personally happen to think there is no justification for the National Science Foundation. I have, uh, as it happens, I haven't received a grant from them, but I might have. <laughs> I haven't asked them. It hasn't been that they've turned me down. But nonetheless, do you suppose my colleagues would not be inhibited in speaking out? In fact, I've often said about the only people who have any real freedom of speech left are people who are in the fortunate position of myself, uh, tenured professors at major private universities on the verge of retirement. <laughs> now, let me give you an even more chilling story about freedom of press. The other day, I got a clipping from a friend of mine, a clipping from an English paper, to the effect that the London Times had been prevented from publishing on one day because the unions that controlled the press refused to publish it because the issue carried a story that was critical of the policies of unions. Now, what, what does that make of freedom of press? And do you mean to say there aren't American newspapers, and many of them, which would hesitate very much before printing stories and articles? that would be regarded as antagonistic by the trade unions on which they depend to get out their paper? So do not kid yourself. There is no way of separating economic freedom from political freedom. If you don't have economic freedom, you don't have political freedom. And uh, the only way you can have the one is to have the other. Now, so much for the present. What about the past? The closest approach to free enterprise we've ever had, in my opinion, in the United States, was the 19th century period. And yet you and your children will hear over and over again in their schools and in their classes the myth that that was a terrible period when the robber barons were grinding the poor, miserable people under their heels. That's a myth constructed out of whole cloth. The plain fact is that never in human history has there been a period when the ordinary man improved his condition and benefited his life as much as he did during that period of the 19th century when you had the closest approach to free enterprise that you have ever had. Most of us in this room, I venture to say, are beneficiaries of that period. I speak of myself. My parents came to this country in the 1890s. Like millions of others, they came with empty hands, and they were enabled to find a place in this country and to build a life for themselves and to provide a basis on which their children and their children's children could have a better life. There is no saga in history remotely comparable to the saga of the United States during this era, welcoming millions and millions of people from all over the world and enabling them to find a place for themselves and to improve their lot. And it was possible only because you had an essentially free society. If the laws and regulations that today hamstring industry and commerce had been in effect in the 19th century, our standard of living today would be the standard of living below that of the 19th century, and it would have been impossible to have absorbed the millions of people who came in this country. The question is, what produced the shift? Why did we move from that situation in which we had an essentially free society to a situation in which today we are moving toward an increasing regimentation by government. The fundamental course of the shift, in my opinion, and the fundamental cause of most government interventions, is an unholy coalition between well-meaning people seeking to good, do good on the one hand, and special interests, meaning you and me, on the other, taking advantage of those activities for our own purposes. You have had the great movement toward government has not come about as a result of people with evil intentions trying to do evil. The great growth of government has come about out of good people trying to do good. But the method by which they have tried to do good has been basically flawed. They have tried to do good with other people's money. And doing good with other people's money has two basic flaws. In the first place, you never spend anybody else's money as carefully as you spend your own. So, 
So a large fraction of that money is inevitably wasted. In the second place, and equally important, you cannot do good with other people's money unless you first get the money away from them. <laughs> so that force, sending a policeman to take the money from somebody's pocket, is fundamentally at the basis of the philosophy of the welfare state. And that is why the attempt by good people to do good has led to disastrous results. It was this movement toward welfare statism that produced the phenomenon in Chile under which ended up in the Allende regime. It is this tendency to try to do good with other people's money which is, has brought Great Britain, once the greatest nation of the earth, the nation which is the source of our traditions and our values and our beliefs in a free society, has brought Great Britain to the edge of catastrophe, to a position in which it will be touch and go whether over the next five years it will be able to maintain a free society or relapse into collectivism. It's, when you start on this road to do good with other people's money, it's easy at first. You've got a lot of people to pay taxes and a small number of people with whom you're trying to do good. But the later stages become harder and harder. As the number of people there on the receiving end grows, you end up in the position where you're taxing 50% of the people to help 50% of the people, or really 100% of the people, to help to, to, to distribute benefits to 100%. The reductio ad absurdum of this policy is a proposal to send out a rain of $50 checks to all and sundry in the next few months. But Bill Banowski has told me I've got to keep my comments short, so I've got to move on and get away from that question to the next question of where do we go from here? People will say, well, you can't turn the clock back. How can you go back? Well, the thing that always amuses me about that argument is that the people who make it are, who, who accuse me and my colleagues of trying to turn the clock back to the 19th century are themselves busily at work trying to turn the clock back to the 18th or the 17th century. Adam Smith, 200 years ago, in 1776, wrote The Wealth of Nations. It was an attack on government controls of his time, on mercantilism, on tariffs, on restrictions, on governmental monopoly. But those are exactly the results which the present-day reformers are seeking to achieve. In any event, that's a foolish question. The real question isn't, are you turning the clock back or forward, but are you doing the right thing? The answer to those who say, are you going to turn the clock back is, do you mean to say you should never learn from your mistakes? But people argue, well, that's a silly. Technological changes require big government. You no longer can talk in the terms of the 19th century of a government which only absorbs 3% or federal government of the national income. You have to have big government because of these technological changes. That's a bunch of nonsense from beginning to end. Some technological changes, no doubt, require government to engage in activities different from those which they did before. But other technological changes reduce the need for government. The improvements in communication and transportation has greatly reduced the possibility of local monopoly, which requires government intervention to protect consumers. Moreover, if you look at the record, the great go growth of government has not been in areas dictated by technological change. The great growth of government has been to take money from some people and give it to others. Now, the only way technology has entered into that is by providing the computers which make it possible to do that. But then other people will say, but how can you talk about stopping this trend? What about big business? Is it really any different whether automobiles are made by General Motors, which is an enormous bureaucratic enterprise employing thousands of people, or whether it's made by an agency of the US government, which is another bureaucratic enterprise? And the answer to that is very simple. Yes, it makes all the difference in the world, because there is a fundamental difference between the two. There is no way in which General Motors can get a dollar from you unless you agree to give it to them. That's a voluntary exchange. They can only get money from you by providing you with something that you value more than the money you give them. 
If they try to force something on you that you don't want, well, ask Mr. Henry Ford what happened when they tried to introduce the Edsel. <laughs> on the other hand, the government can get money from you without your consent. They can send policemen to take it out of your pocket. General Motors doesn't have that power. And that is all the difference in the world between a society in which exchange is voluntary and a society in which exchange is not. It's all the reason why the government, when it is in the saddle, produces poor quality at high cost, while industry, when it is in the saddle, produces high quality at low cost, because the one does have to satisfy its customers and the other do, does not. Where shall we go from here? I come to the end. There are two possible scenarios. The one, and I very much fear it's the more likely, is that we will continue the direction in which we've been going. That we will continue in the direction of gradual increases in the scope of government, of gradual extensions of government control. If we do continue in that direction, two results are inevitable. One is financial crisis, and the other is a loss of freedom. The example of un the United Kingdom of England is a frightening example to contemplate. England has been moving in this direction. We're about 20 years behind England in this motion. But England has been moving in this direction from earlier than we were moving and has moved much farther. And the effects are patent and clear. But at least when England moved in this direction, and as a result, lost its power politically and internationally, the United States was there to take over the defense of the free world. But I ask you, when the United States follows in that direction, who is going to take over from us? That's one scenario, and I very much fear it's the more likely one. The other scenario is that we will, in fact, halt this trend, call a halt to the inevitable, to the apparently increasing growth of government, set a limit, and hold it back. Now, there are many favorable signs from this point of view. I may say that the greatest reason for hope that we will not continue in the former direction, that we will stop this, the greatest reason for hope, in my opinion, is the inefficiency of government. Many people complain about government waste. I welcome it. I welcome it for two reasons. In the first place, any efficiency is not a desirable thing if somebody is doing a bad thing. <laughs> a great teacher of mine Harold Hotelling, a mathematical economist, once wrote an article on the teaching of statistics. And he said, pedagogical ability is a vice rather than a virtue if it is devoted to teaching error. Well, that's the fundamental principle. Government is doing things that we don't want it to do. Well, then the more money it wastes, the better. But in the second place, the waste brings home to the public at large the fact that government is not an efficient and effective instrument for achieving its objectives. One of the great causes for hope is a growing disillusionment around the country with the idea that government is the all-wise, all-powerful big brother who can solve every problem that comes along. That if only you throw enough money at a problem, it'll be resolved. Some four or five or six years ago, John Kenneth Galbraith wrote an article in which he said that there was no problem that New York City had that could be, not be solved by, a, by an increase in government spending in New York. <laughs> well, since that time, the, government, the budget of the city of New York has more than doubled, and so have the problems of New York. And the one is cause and the other effect. Because what's happened is that the government has spent more, but that meant that people have less to spend. And since the government spends much money less efficiently than individuals spend their own money, it's because government spending has gone up that the problems have gotten worse. But my main point is that this inefficiency, this waste, brings home to the public at large the undesirability 
of governmental intervention. And I believe that that's a major source of hope is in the widespread rise in the tide of feeling that government is not the appropriate way to solve our problems. But there are also many unfavorable signs. It's far easier to enact laws than to repeal them. There is a, 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 the spe every special interest, including you and me, has a great resistance to giving up its special privileges. I remember two years ago, roughly, when after, shortly after Jerry Ford became president, you may recall he called a summit conference to do something about the problem of inflation. And I sat in the at that summit conference and heard one representative of one group after another go to the podium, the representatives of business, the representative of farmers, the representatives of labor, you name the group. They all went to the podium and they all said the same thing. They said, of course, we recognize that in order to stop inflation, we must cut down government spending. And I tell you, the way to cut down government spending is to spend more on me. <laughs> that was a universal refrain. Many people say that one of the causes for hope is a rising recognition by the business community and business enterprises of the threat to the free enterprise system. I wish I could believe that, but I do not. I'm, you must recognize the facts. Business corporations in general are not a defense of free enterprise. On the contrary, they are one of the chief sources of danger. The two greatest enemies of free enterprise in the United States, in my opinion, have been and are on the one hand, the, my fellow intellectuals, and on the other hand, the business corporations of this country, for opposite reasons. Every one of my fellow intellectuals believes in freedom for himself. He wants free speech. He wants free research. If I tell him, gee, isn't this a terrible waste that a dozen people are studying the same problem? Oughtn't we to have a central planning committee to decide what research projects various individuals ought to undertake? He'll look at me as if I'm crazy, and he'll say, what do you mean? Don't you understand about the value of academic freedom and freedom of research and duplication? But when it comes to business, he says, oh, that wasteful competition, that duplication over there. We've got to have a central planning board to make those things intelligent, sensible. So every intellectual is in favor of freedom for himself and against freedom for anybody else. The businessmen, the business enterprises and businessmen are very different. Every businessman, every business enterprise is in favor of freedom for everybody else. But when it comes to himself, hmm, that's a different question. We have to have that tariff to protect us against competition from abroad. We have to have that special provision in the tax code. We have to have that subsidy. So businessmen are in favor of freedom for everybody else, but not for themselves. I say businessmen, and I don't mean it. There are many notable exceptions. There are many business leaders who have been extremely far-sighted in their understanding of the problem and who have come to the defense of a free enterprise system. But as to the business community in general, the, its tendency to take out advertisements, U.S. Steel Company taking out full-page ads to advertise the virtues of free enterprise and then pleading before Congress for an import quota on steel from Japan, the only result of that is for everybody who is fair-minded to say, what a bunch of hypocrites. And they're right. Now, I don't blame, don't misunderstand me, I don't blame the business enterprise, I don't blame U.S. Steel for seeking to get those special privileges. The managers of U.S. Steel have an obligation to their stockholders, and they would be false to that obligation if they did not try to take advantage of the opportunities to get assistance. So I don't blame them, but I blame the rest of us for letting them get away with it. I, I say we must recognize what the real problem is and recognize that that is not a source of strength. I could go on that for that for a long time, but my time is limited. I only want to say, where are we going to end up? I do not know. I think that depends on a great many things. But I am reminded of a story which will illustrate what we may need. This is one of those shaggy dog stories that I heard some time ago, and it has to do with a young and attractive nun who was driving a car down a road, down a superhighway, and ran out of gas. And she remembered that a mile back on the highway, there had been a gas station. And so she got out of her car and hiked up her habit and walked back up the mile to the gas station. When she got to the gas station, she found that there was only one young man in attendance there. He said he'd love to help her, but he couldn't leave the gas station because he was the only one. 
But he said he would try to find a container in which he could give her some gas. He hunted around the gas station. He couldn't find a decent container. The only thing he could finally found was a little baby's potty that happened to have been left there. So he filled the baby potty up with gasoline and he gave it to the nun. She took the baby potty and walked a mile down the road to her car. She got to her car and opened the gas tank and started to pour it in. And just at this moment, a great big Cadillac came barreling down the road at 80 miles an hour. And the driver who was looking out couldn't believe what he was seeing. <laughs> so he jammed on his brakes and stopped and backed up and opened the window and looked out and said, Sister, I only wish I had such faith. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to handle asking questions, raising questions for a few yes. minutes? Now, we're going to take some questions. We're going to have about 10, min 10 minutes of questions. Please stand where you are seated. Speak loudly so that the question will not have to be repeated and address it to Dr. Friedman. And we believe in freedom, so those of you who have to leave, thank you for coming. Goodbye. Yes. No, I don't believe so at all. I believe that the cost of having troops overseas in Japan and elsewhere has undoubtedly imposed a burden on all of us. It means that there's a part of our national income that is not available for other purposes. But there is no special way in which that impinges on U.S. steel, and there is no way in which that justifies anything but complete free trade in steel. The point of the matter is that that illustrates the great fallacy in people's analysis of the economic, of economic problems. Almost all fallacies arise out of overemphasizing the visible effects of policy and underemphasizing the invisible effects. If U.S. Steel is, uh, has competition from Japan, if Japan sends over steel at relatively low cost, that does, of course, hurt U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel can produce less. But on the other hand, it means, in the first place, that consumers of steel are benefited by having steel at lower price. In the second place, and equally important, it means that Japan has dollars to spend in the United States, which increases the demand for other goods, which means that other industries in the United States are benefited by being able to sell more to Japan. I understand the U.S. Steel's personal interest, but from the national point of view, I do not believe there is any justification whatsoever I am a one with Adam Smith in believing that the best course of action for this nation would be complete free trade throughout in every area, unilaterally achieved, and not by means of international negotiation. We're a great nation. We ought to set a standard for the world. You know, you take U.S. Steel, let me take some other cases. Do you think it really befits us as a great nation to go worrying about little Hong Kong and saying you mustn't compete with us by sending over your textiles? You have to set quotas on them? That isn't the way we should behave as a great nation. The argument is a very tempting one. But we must beware. We believe in freedom. And we must not be selective in our beliefs. We must not say we believe in freedom when it benefits us, but we don't believe in it when it hurts us. Because then what we're going to get is a collection of all those things that hurt us. Yes. I don't know that Pepperdine University can do it because I don't believe that that is really the function of Pepperdine University. I think Pepperdine University and every other university has to try to teach uh, what it can to the students it has. But I believe that the problem you're raising is a very important one and goes to a very different question. 
We are in a paradox from this point of view. We have a socialist school system. How do we expect a socialist school system to teach free enterprise principles? It can't. Every institution is going to act in accordance with its own nature. And one of the great problems we have, in my opinion, in the area you're talking about, is introducing a reform in the public, so-called public school system. I say so-called because we mean governmental. You know, supposedly Pepperdine is a private institution and uh, UCLA is a public institution. That's a bunch of nonsense. Pepperdine is every, much as mu every bit as much a public institution as UCLA is. It serves the public. And UCLA is every bit as much a private institution. It serves the interests of the people who are employed by UCLA. In fact, in a fundamental way, Pepperdine, UCLA is far more private than Pepperdine is because Pepperdine has to satisfy the public or it doesn't exist. And uh, UCLA, well, it does have to satisfy the public in a certain way, but it's only the legislature and the taxpaying public rather than the public who comes to its schools. But I go back to your question. I think the fundamental thing we need in your, in your question is an introduction of a voucher system for schooling, a system under which parents would be able to, if they chose to send their children to non-governmental schools, would be able to get some part of the money which they are saving the community and thus have free choice for the schools to which they send their children. We have one more question we can take, according to Bill, and in, in, the, in the principles that we have been following, how much am I bid? <laughs> yes. Well, the question is a very good one. It's what recourse do we have personally against government interference? We have two recourses. One of the points I should have mentioned of hope is the extraordinary ingenuity of the American public in finding ways to get around laws. <laughs> Years ago, right after the war in 1947, on our way to the founding meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society, my colleague and friend George Stigler and I went first to Britain and then to France and then to Switzerland. And after we had been in Britain, which at that time was in the throes of the post-war period of extensive controls, rationing, and so on, and in France, which in that period was in the throes of extensive black markets, and then to Switzerland, George said, now I know the difference between Britain, France, and the United States. He said the fundamental difference is that the British obey all laws, good, bad, or indifferent. The French obey no laws, good, bad, or indifferent. The Americans obey the good laws. <laughs> That's one recourse, and it's a very important one. The second is, and now I'm going to take you more seriously on a different level, because I think the real question is, what can we as a practical matter do to try to promote something which will stop this process? I think we have two problems. We have a long-range problem of changing the attitudes and opinions of people. A fundamental reason for the drift we've been in has been a change in philosophy from a doctrine of individual responsibility to a doctrine of social responsibility. And that is a long-range project of changing that opinion. I think such change is underway. I see it on all sides, among the young, among others. The question is, in the interim, how do we hold the fort to give the, that development of ideas a chance to work? And there I must say, if you'll pardon me in going into specifics, I think the most promising idea is one which was tried out here three years ago under the uh, sponsorship of Ronnie Reagan, Prop 1, a proposal to have a constitutional amendment that would set a limit to spending at the state level as a fraction of the income of the people. <laughs> we tried that last fall in Michigan, it's Proposal C. We were beaten in California, we were beaten in Michigan in both cases by the same groups. Namely, primarily by the Educational Association, the Association of, of the uh, school teachers, not the teachers themselves, but their officials, operating behind the cloak, I am sorry to say, of the League of Women Voters, an organization which has for long been in favor 
of expanding the scope of government and therefore was willing to offer itself for this purpose. We were beaten those times, but we got to keep on trying. If you look at the way in which the collectivist measures have been adopted, they have been beaten, they have been beaten, they have been beaten, and they have kept on pushing them until finally they get passed. We must take a leaf of their book and do the same. And I think the most promising way of trying to hold the fort for the time being, preventing this from going farther, is through pushing for tax and or rather spending limitation amendments on both the state level and on the federal level. There is widespread <laughs> there is widespread interest in this in many states. The Southern Governors Conference had a task force which worked out an amendment for the federal constitution and which was endorsed at the last meeting of the Southern Governors Conference. I think this is not an idea which is impossible. I think of all the things on the horizon, it's the most promising single political initiative, not as a final solution, but as a stopgap to give us time to get the final solution, which must be a change in ideas. Thank you very much. Please remain, please remain standing. Dr. Dr. Friedman has a book for all of the associates, his book on public policy. There's no such thing as a free lunch at the door. And it has something in common with President Cor Carter in, the, in that it includes his famous essay in, in his famous interview in Playboy magazine. This group of Pepperdine Associates next meets in February 1978. I don't know what we do for an encore with this Nobel laureate, but I can tell you we have been in touch with Alexander Solzhenitsyn. <laughs> now tonight, tonight we have raised over $1 million. I'll tell you how. There are 428, uh, 428 Associates at $1,000 each. Seven of you are founding life members following the USC Caltech pattern of a $10,000 one-time gift. They are Mrs. Frank Roger Seaver, Fritz Huntsinger Sr., Mark C. Bloom Sr., George A. Evans, Leonard H. Strauss, Richard Ralphs, George W. Elkins. That's $70,000. And then one person here tonight choosing to remain anonymous has given us a gift of $557,000 as a matching amount for $1,055,000. While you're standing, while you're standing, if you'll stop the music, we're going to ask the person who, in my judgment, has done more in 40 years, given with his wife 22 of those years to this school, has done more to make this evening possible than any other person, our Chancellor, Dr. Norval Young, as we have the benediction. Dr. Young. Thank you. Shall we pray? Dear God, we are thankful that we have a country in which a man who is free, like Milton Friedman, can speak his mind to us as free to hear and to act. And we are thankful for these 428 associates who are joining us at Pepperdine in the battle against ignorance, fear, prejudice, superstition and hate and collectivism. And we pray that this night may be multiplied to the blessing not only of the thousands of people who will come under the influence of those touched by teachers like those that have been presented and who serve on our faculties, but will reach many others, even to those yet unborn and that our country may always be free. We make this prayer in the Master's name. Amen.